Small Talk with BJ, the podcast where trial attorney and legal commentator BJ Bernstein and her guests discuss the latest issues from around the legal world. BJ is a frequent commentator on television and radio. She's unique in that she not only comments on legal issues, having been lead counsel on numerous high-profile cases of national interest, but her relatable personal style allows the viewer to understand the law behind the headlines and why it's important. Now, here's your host, B.J. Bernstein. Welcome to Law Talk with B.J. My guest today is very special. It is an honor to have him, and it's an honor because he's the only guest so far that I need to say your honor when I'm in court (laughs) with him. I have the chief judge of the Georgia Court of Appeals, Stephen Dillard, as my guests. Welcome to Law Talk. Thank you. It's great to be here. This is really, this is kind of fun because normally you would be asking me questions. Uh, The tables are turned. Tables are turned. That's right. That's right. I I didn't tell you about my secret list of questions. Oh, wow. Okay. (laughs) Well, bring them on. No. Um, So first I want to just introduce you, you know, to our audience. Sure. Because we have folks in Georgia who may know of you, but beyond, you actually are a national figure in the appellate world, um, the American Bar Association, um, just in their journal, had you listed as one of the t- top 100 people to pay attention to on social media with legal issues. You were just named by the Georgia Law um, Legislature as Twitter Laureate of the state <laughs> of right. Georgia. Um, and you are the chief judge of... Um, one of the we have two appellate courts in Georgia, the Georgia right. Supreme Court and the Georgia Court of Appeals. And you are unique, and that's what we're going to talk about amongst jurists in even agreeing to do this with me. Yeah. Yeah. And um so first let's talk about your job as an appellate judge. Sure. So for our audience, you know, we've talked a lot about trials so far. Right. But what's the difference between a trial court and an appellate court? If you can kind of give an overview. So an appellate court, there are no juries, right? There's not a jury. Uh, Appellate courts, uh, and this is a simplistic way of talking about it, but I view appellate courts as really a backstop, right? Justice normally should happen at the trial level. Sometimes um, things don't go right at the trial. Something happens. And when that happens, if someone's unhappy with the decision at the, at the trial level, whether it's civil or criminal, they can appeal. And to me, there's really two core functions of appellate courts. One is to ensure fair proceedings below. And the second is to protect what I call the corpus juris or the body of law. We write opinions and our written opinions, unlike the trial courts, are actually published. And so the trial courts look to the opinions of the Georgia Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court of Georgia, and that is the law in Georgia. It is the case law in Georgia. We interpret statutes. We interpret the the common law. We build on the common law. And so when lawyers are arguing cases, whether it's civil or criminal throughout Georgia, they look to the Court of Appeals decisions and the Supreme Court decisions, and those decisions help guide the outcomes in cases. And so it's it's, it's an important job. There's only 15 of us. We're a statewide court. Unlike other states, our appellate, our intermediate appellate court, which is what we are, we're not divided civilly or into civil appeals only or criminal appeals only. We're not in districts where, um, you know, we're competing. Uh, you have a northern or middle. We are a unified intermediate appellate court. We're headquartered in Atlanta. Uh, there's 15 of us and we serve 10 and a half million people. And, you know, as you were talking about the decisions, you know, the lay person, when you're going to a court, if it's criminal, a jury comes back with a verdict, guilty right. or not guilty. Or if it's a civil case, perhaps over money, um, they'll either award money or not award money. Right. Or make decisions about what you can and can't do, perhaps, you know, a That's land right. use case or something sure. like that. Then what's interesting, I guess, even as... I get the pleasure of doing both areas of law. There's some lawyers right. only try cases. There's some that do appellate. You know, there is a whole different feel and a turn when you're getting to the appellate level right. and the the nerd factor goes up. Goes so up to exponentially, speak. <laughs> yes. Exponentially. Yes. Um, because, you know, when we're in a, when we're trying to, I'm trying to convince a jury of something. Right. Of, 
in, in my role as a criminal defense attorney, that they are not guilty. Right. I may talk about what the statute says, but I'm not necessarily reading to them from an opinion right. about the nuances of the law. Right. But when I lose, which it does happen. Yes. Um, and I am We've grateful, all been there. And, well, and I'm grateful for the appellate courts because some of my biggest wins in my career for clients that had impact was by getting to an appellate court right. to say, you know what, this law was wrong or this procedure was applied improperly. Right. Um, and if you can kind of explain to my guests a little bit, our, our listeners, a little bit better about how that process works in terms of evaluating what the trial level has done and it's brought to you. So let's let's begin with the the first I think threshold matter and that is being a trial court judge is, is hard. I mean it's it's everything's moving fast and and you it, it's a little bit different at the appellate court. We, we you have to make split second decisions at the trial court level and even though our court of appeals and Supreme Court are unique that we have these constitutional deadlines that that we have to meet every year meaning especially at the court of appeals you know that when you file an appeal with our court, it's going to be decided in eight months. That sounds like a lot of time, but it's really not. In other states, appeals can drag on for years, even five years. And at a certain point, justice delayed is justice denied, right? So that's one great feature about our Georgia Constitution. It is a very deliberative process. So once the trial is completed, um, let's just take a, a typical example. You've got a breach of contract trial. Um, the, the the judgment uh, has been entered. Um, you disagree with something that happened at trial. You file um, your notice of appeal. You've got 30 days to do that once the verdict's been entered. You file your notice. The record has to be put together. You say. And, and what the record is is, is, is if there was a trial if there were and the documents, transcripts. Right. And transcript of the proceedings, the trial. Um, any documents that would have been involved, any what we call discovery. It's just when, when you have maybe depositions or when you have interrogatories, and those are questions that you pose to each other as, as parties. So all of that comes up to us in a nice package. It can take anywhere from you know, four to even eight months, sometimes a year to get a record together, depending on how big the case is. It eventually comes up to us. It's docketed. And once it's docketed, it's assigned to a judge and assigned to a panel. And uh, we get that and, and we begin work on it. And it is very much, you know, one reason you don't see a lot of TV shows about the appellate world is because so much is done behind the scenes. It is a lot of writing and it's a lot of research. As you pointed out, it, it is like for a law nerd like me, it is heaven because I love writing and I love research. And so we don't really interact with lawyers except when they come to oral argument. Our court holds oral argument nine months out of the year. Each panel, we have five panels of three. Uh, we hear all of our cases in three judge panels. Uh, unlike the Supreme Court of Georgia, where all nine of them hear every single case. It's we operate we we have similar functions, but they're obviously the last word on everything and they decide everything collectively. The point of a an intermediate appellate court is to give a level of appellate review, but to do so in a in a more efficient way and by using three judges. And so those decisions can be dealt with uh, I think in a more efficient manner because you have three judges. But at the Supreme Court level, it makes a lot more sense to have nine because they're the final word. And so you want as many eyeballs and people having discussions about those cases as possible. So, and you're setting precedent. The Supreme right. Court is setting precedent. Correct. But sometimes with the Supreme Court, it's a broader issue right. beyond that case that the court realizes, you know, we've got to decide this particular person's or right. party's fate. But this could be duplicated and we right. need to, to And that's set the us standard. too. I mean, we 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 have that exact same function. The only di so like if we have an issue of first impression in Georgia and the and that case comes to us at the Court of Appeals and it's not it doesn't go directly to them and we can talk about that later if we want. But most cases, 85% of all the appeals in Georgia come through us first. There's some cases that jump us and go directly to the Supreme Court. Some of those categories would make sense to you and and your listeners even if they're not lawyers death penalty cases, right? If you challenge the constitutionality of an ordinance, if you have an election contest where, where timing is crucial, they go on and send those, those cases go directly to the Supreme Court. But if they do come to us first, uh, it's not one of those types of cases. Um, we, if we say something, it is the law in Georgia 
until the Supreme Court says otherwise. So when you've got a court that I call us the workhorse court, right? When you have a court that's deciding 85 percent of all appeals as a practical matter, the Court of Appeals of Georgia is the court of last resort for a lot of folks. And we do establish the law in a lot of different areas. Um, th there's only so many cases the Supreme Court can review. So we work in tandem with the Supreme Court, hopefully to establish clear precedent. And why that matters is so that people can live their lives and have expectations about what the law is, right? That's, that's the difference between the United States and other areas of the world. We have uh, a democracy, we have the rule of law, and we settle our disputes in, in a civil way. It's sometimes a messy process, but there is a beauty in it that, that we're able to, even in the most contentious matters, we're able to have due process, we're able to have lawyers, um, you know, have the push and pull and, and iron sharpens iron of going through the adversarial process. And through that, we come all the way through it and can go all the way up to the Supreme Court of Georgia or the Supreme Court of the United States. And then once that decision comes down, we have a society that says, OK, we're all going to abide by that decision. And that's that really we take that for granted. But that really is an amazing, beautiful feature of our American republic. Absolutely. Because there's a you know, the whole point is to avoid the call to arms. You know, we don't want to be in a state of right. conflict right? and to be able to debate them in a way that is respectful. Right. And I know for you, one of the things that your tenure with this court has been about also is really emphasizing the respect and I even kind of use the word kindness with you. Oh, that's of sweet. The, the need to that we are in a battle. I mean, and, right. and, and it can be you know, the incarceration of someone for life, and yet that we still have to conduct ourselves in a way such that we listen to each other sure. and not use sharp language um, for the point of um, digging it into someone. Right. Um, as opposed to, you know, and I think that's something that you've talked about some, and part of which leads into what the other really unique part of you, which uh, many people are starting to follow, the headway of how much you do participate in the public arena as a judge right. um, and express your opinions, um, not on cases. But or political matters. I don't discuss anything partisan. I don't discuss. But I, but I think as a public figure, as a judge, you know, I, I say this all the time. This to me, this idea that judges are kind of in this ivory tower and and they're disconnected from the people they serve. I don't think that model has served us well. And I think that with folks coming up my age and younger, there is more of an expectation that, you know, look, judges are public servants at the end of the day. We wear robes. And yes, it's a very important role, but that doesn't make us better than anybody. We are, we're public servants. And I think we should be accessible to the people. I have 10 uh, 0.5 million bosses, right? I mean, I I am a I was appointed by Governor Purdue, and I'm thankful for that appointment to, for the rest of my life. But I've been elected now twice by the people, and so to me, part of that means being accessible to the people. Now, I can't talk about specific cases, but to me, with this platform comes the ability to do good, and and to try to promote civility, to try to promote civic education, to try to promote professionalism. You know, and I talk about some other things and I also get personal and and share with the people that follow me on social media um, things I'm passionate about. Music. We're in a studio today. A lot of famous musicians record here. That's amazing to me. I'm passionate about college football. Um, I'm passionate about my family, my church. And I think those things, sharing those things with the public and letting them know who I am as a human being I think that's not a bad thing for them to to know me as a person so that when they vote for me, they, you know, I, I'm pretty transparent. I tell people all the time, you know, I think people that know me and and follow me on social media would tell you that my social media profile is an accurate reflection of who I am in real life. Now, maybe you don't see all the warts. We're all, you know, uh, I'm certainly not perfect and I have my moments. You're and I carry out the garbage in any yeah. of those photos. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I think my wife and my kids who see me more than anybody would tell you, I'm sorry, I, I don't ever profess to be perfect, but I do think there is the idea that there are ideals that we strive for. And to me, you know, and I, I don't make any bones about it. I'm a person of faith. 
Um, I'm a Christian. I'm a Catholic. And to me, at the very core of my faith is really two things, and that is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. And to me, I always tell people, if once I master those two things, I'll worry about everything else. Not that those other issues that divide us aren't important, but if we if we were trying to love each other as we love ourselves, if we respected every person and understood that every human being, no matter how bad we might think they are, has inherent dignity and worth as a human being, I think we'd be better off as a society. If we if we started from a place of charity and started from a place of empathy, why is this person acting this way? Maybe they're hurt. Maybe instead of responding to their provocation, I tried to get to know them as a person. Maybe I listen instead of talk. Um, and I haven't always done that, right? So I say that because I need to hear it as much as anyone else. And so you know, I try to promote those things and encourage civility uh, on social media and in real life because I think there it concerns me. It seems like there's been a breakdown of that, that we are more divided than we've ever been. But at the end of the day, we all want to be loved. We all want to feel um, like we have deep friendships. We all want to feel connected. We all want to be a part of something bigger, regardless of our faith. And so... You know, I, I just think if 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 we approach each other in that way, and we start from from it may sound poly you know Pollyannish to um, uh, to say that, but you know we can make a choice, right? We can't always affect what's going on in Washington D.C., but you know you and I could have different views on issues, and we can start with the idea that we respect each other, that we recognize the inherent dignity in one another, and that we're willing to to have discussions about the things we do agree on. And that's part of, the, I mean, pe- part of why I love law, right? Is and you know I can go into a courtroom and have a s- advocate one way, someone advocate the other, and we're not walking out the door having a fight or shooting each other. We're, we're having a passionate, intense. Um, debate about what we are arguing about in court. But there's a difference between arguing and, as you said, right. the, the civility factor that that you mentioned. Um, right. And that if we could add that to problem solving, you know, and teach that to young people in schools. That's why right. I always am an advocate of, you know, in the schools, understanding law sure. when you're young. Because the consequences, I've had a lot of young clients over the years that have uh, made the news for decisions that were not thought out, right. and no one had ever said, "Oh, by the way, that's against the law." Right. You know, we, we we should set some tenets of knowing the basics um, as part of our schooling uh, and part of our education, so that we're prepared when and if you know, because you, you never know when you're going to need to go to court. It's not always criminal. You know, the right. divorces, there's custody issues, there's lawsuits over. Um, natural resources, sure. I mean, just all kinds of things. The other interesting part you mentioned, because when you talk about social media, I, I will confess when you were coming along and became on the court and you started tweeting and I was a very early Twitter follower right. and there was an article in the local legal paper that I was tweeting and some other people were tweeting and then when you were tweeting, I was like, whoa, a judge is tw-. I mean, I was right. a little taken aback. I you mean, weren't the only one. And even now, I think I read a relatively recent article that you wrote really proposing to lawyers and other judges why it's okay to engage in social media. Right. Um, why I've read it, but why do you think that's so important? I think it's what I said earlier, the idea that judges are public servants and that we ought to be accessible to the people. You know, one of the things you always hear, especially is that these judicial races, nobody knows who the candidates are. And maybe some judges in the past have taken comfort in that, that that basically voters going, you know, that we do look, there are appointments at the federal level where they don't stand for election. They, they go through a Senate process and that process, as we've seen, is broken. And I'm not blaming one side or the other. I think almost anybody would objectively agree that the federal judicial confirmation process is broken down in Georgia as a state. We decided early on that judges would be directly accountable to the people. There are some people that don't like judicial elections. There are some people that think they're an abomination. I think Georgia does it about as well as any state. We are nonpartisan and, and rightfully so. I'm not a Republican judge. I'm not a Democratic judge. 
I am I'm not anything other than a judge, and I like being nonpartisan, and um, I think that has helped keep our elections for the most part as a check. Uh, in the sense that if somebody's really getting out of line, then then somebody from the bar, and I commend the bar, I think the bar has been fantastic in trying to ensure the independence of our state judiciary and, and to depoliticize that uh, process. And so I'm really proud of our state bar and our lawyers. Um, if you look at Alabama and you look at Mississippi and Texas and their judicial elections, um, there's a lot of instability in those judiciaries because you have these cyclical elections where one party may come in and they have to run as a political party, which to me is just insane that a judge is affiliating with a political party. Because when someone comes to court before me, I don't want them coming before me thinking that they are automatically behind the eight ball because they might have different policy views than I do. You know, I tell people all the time, I rule in ways that I hate all the time. That's, That's interesting. Uh, That's fascinating. All, all the time. And, you know, um, people may have issues with them, but Justice Scalia used to say that if you like every decision you make as a judge, you're probably not a very good judge. And I frequently have decisions where if I were just applying kind of Chief Judge Diller justice, I would go the, the, you know, the opposite way. Um, but to me, I approach every case and say, OK, where does the law take me? And the truth is my staff attorneys you know, if, if we were sitting around talking about policy, my staff attorneys have very, very different political and and policy views than, than I do on do, a personal do level. Because I don't care. I want smart, thoughtful people oh, I was gonna ask you, that are going to help. No, there's no. Do you intentionally, though, try to have a diverse viewpoint yes, of, yeah, of the absolutely. clerks that work for you? I, I tell people all the time, I've got a strong enough personality that I want to be challenged. And when I hired all of my folks, I told them, I said, if you're going to come in here and you're just going to basically tell me yes, and you're not going to push back if you think I'm wrong, you're not doing me any favors. Don't take this job. And my staff attorneys are really bright and, and they, you know, at a certain point, once they've advised me, I then have to make the decision. I'm the judge. I'm the one that was appointed and elected by the people. And so, but, but I want them to challenge me. I want them. And, and there have been, um, I mean, for the most part, we agree because in a lot of the cases, the answers are fairly obvious. Sometimes it, it, it takes a while to get there. But in, in the really difficult cases, you want people that are going to challenge you and that, that are going to make you better. I always want to be, I tell people, I always want to be in a room full of people smarter than me. You know, I want to be challenged because it's like running the race. You want someone that's going to set a brisk pace for you. And so I love being around uh, people that are going to challenge me intellectually. And so I hired really, really smart staff attorneys and they do a good job of helping me write the opinions and challenging me. And like I said, they do come from uh, different. But the interesting thing is we we all really, I think, agree about how we should approach the law and that we take a very nonpartisan approach. I mean, it is not unusual for me to rule for a criminal defendant. It's not unusual for me to rule for the state. I rule for plaintiffs in personal injury cases all the time. I've I've ruled for corporate defendants. I mean, if you look at my cases, the published, I think you'll see I'm kind of everywhere because every case is different. And I don't I don't it doesn't matter to me who wins. I mean, I like I said, I might have my own views about whether the end result seems just or makes sense. But you really don't want Steve Dillard imposing his form of justice. That's not what I was appointed by the governor to do. And that's not what I was elected by the people to do. Those decisions have to be made over in the gold dome. That's where, to me, if the you legislative that, branch. That, that, that's the legislative branch. If you want to have policy decisions, then you go debate those. If I wanted to do that, I would run for the General Assembly and stop being a judge. But I love being a judge. There's almost a purity to it, you know, but you can, I, I tell people I live in my law bubble where there's no politics and we just try to get it right every day. And I work with very talented judges, my colleagues and their staff attorneys and our clerk's office and our tech people and our fiscal. I mean, we have such an amazing group of employees and our clerk at the Court of Appeals. It's we're really fortunate. In terms of dealing with your colleagues, with with the other judges, because, you know, a decision is a, not a decision of one. It's a right. division of, of, of a panel or potentially right. um, more. Um, how do you navigate? How 
a little bit of behind the scenes, if sure. you can, about how you're navigating the personalities because you you get to know each other really well. Sure. Working, um, how how do y'all work through it? And and when it gets a little bit more contentious, how how do y'all finally? We're a very, get to where you can keep going. Yeah, we're a very collegial court, and that's a good thing. We all come from different backgrounds. You know, we have, for example, Judge Carla McMillan, first Asian American uh, appellate judge in the Southeast, uh, who's on our court. She came from being a state court judge in Fayette County. We have a vet Miller from Macon, Georgia, who's one of my dear friends, just like Judge McMillan. And uh, I believe she came from the state court as well and had a background on the workers' compensation review board. And uh, so we, and we've got Brian Rickman, a former prosecutor. We've got Mandy Mercier, former Superior Court judge, Judge Reese, who was an administrator uh, with, I think, the Department of Community Health. Um, we, we've got all that Christian Coomer, former legislator, Ken Hodges, former prosecutor. We've got a lot of different, really talented folks. Uh, Judge Gobeil just came directly from the workers comp. And so when you get all these people together and then you've got people like me, uh, Judge Doyle got elected and I got appointed. We came straight from private practice. She came from Holland and Knight. I came from James Bates. Um, and so you, you, you mix all those folks together and y- you know, you just end up where it's a very collaborative process. And yes, we get sideways with each other, but I think we, because you develop those relationships and friendships, you understand that when you disagree, it's not personal. You know, it really is a genuine um, disagreement about the law and you can have reasonable disagreements about the law. And I don't ever attribute to my colleagues bad faith. When we disagree, I, 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 you know, I think they're wrong, of course, or I, I wouldn't be taking the position I'm taking. But I, but I don't ever attribute bad faith because I know them, and I know every one of our judges is dedicated to the rule of law and trying to get it right. Ann Barnes was a very dear friend of mine on the court. She won an election. She came from private practice, and Ann and I probably disagree on a lot of things, in you know, on policy issues. We agree on a lot too. Um, but you know, she's one of my dear friends and we've disagreed on cases and we've had, you know, where we've been on the opposite side, but at the end of the day, we hug each other, we love each other and, and we're, we're, we're trying to get it right. And the thing is she and all the other judges, when I have a disagreement, they actually make my decision better. Uh, sometimes they dissent, but I, I end up making, writing a stronger opinion. And then if it, it can go up to the Supreme court and the Supreme court can look at both opinions and they can say, wow, these are both well-written opinions. And uh, sometimes I say, we disagree with both of them. They both got it wrong. Um, But in sometimes even when there's not a dissent and you just see a unanimous decision, you may not know that I got input from both of the other judges through memos where they were like, this is good opinion. Why don't, if you consider doing this or you consider tweaking this language and it's good to have um, Sarah Dole's a good example that I'm on a panel with her right now and, and Mandy Mercier and both uh, Mandy and Sarah will sometimes write notes and say, you know, have you thought about rephrasing this or have you thought? And I do that for them as well. And so even though it might be my opinion, people shouldn't just believe that it's one judge opinion with two judges rubber stamping. That's, you know, we're, we're, we're getting in. We have we don't formally conference, but we have a lot of informal conferencing and discussions and text messages, you know, hey, give me a call. I want to talk to you about this case. Uh, and we do it at all hours and on the weekends because we're, you know, we've got those deadlines and we've got to meet them. And, and your decisions are in writing and they're they poured over by lawyers. Like like biblical text. Correct. I yeah, can speak yeah, to that. And, yeah, I and, did that. And it's interesting when you're talking about it from your point of view, because I know as an attorney, I remember very young, I had a case at, I, I can't remember, it was the Court of Appeals, Georgia Supreme Court one of my first ones and when i got the decision i saw the name of the person who wrote it and i lit- i used an x of you know o and used a right. word i can't say on the podcast because i had to keep this where anybody can listen yes um and then i saw that judge later and he go and someone I, I was at the courthouse i was at the appellate yeah. i was arguing at the georgia court of appeals and my opinion came out or my supreme court they brought the opinions in and i said oh blank and the clerk heard me i saw the name of the judge and then i saw him later at lawyers club and he goes miss bernstein 
what, what, what did you exactly say when you first saw that opinion? <laughs> and then he busted out laughing because he knew exactly what I had said. Oh, that's funny. Um, and I, he said, you learned a lesson. You can't assume anything. Right. That, you know, I had just typecast him from the other opinions. And right. he was an older um, justice. And, and lo and behold, he agreed. And, and uh, we changed a little law. Right. So... It's interesting to hear the battles in between you and then the same thing happens with us judging judging you at times. Right, Even right. though we are the coming before you uh, beholden to what you decide. I always tell people, you know, if, if you don't like the, the decision I've given you, just, just wait a few months and, you know, you might like the next one. Because <laughs> it, I, I've, it, it's so funny that, you know, people... I, I get it. I mean, lawyers pour their heart and soul into cases. I was there once. I used to get frustrated with appellate decisions, but it's, it's, you know, my message to lawyers is it's not personal, right? And it's, it, and it's also not just about your case. When we're deciding that case, well, you might really think that that case is important and maybe we ought to just, you know, shade the law a little bit to get that outcome for your client, even though maybe you should technically lose under the law. The problem with doing that is, is that there's a ripple effect in, in other cases. You know, Judge Bork used to talk about the temptation to do that, that once you give in to that temptation, the cracks start to appear in the foundation. It might make sense to bend the law a little bit in that case to achieve what you and I might agree would be a more just result. But the problem is when you do that, especially in a published opinion, and then the next case comes up, then the the law, the the clarity and the stability of the law starts to erode. So you have to be careful about that. And that's why to me, you, you know, people can disagree or agree with my approach, which is a much more formalist approach to the law. I'm a textualist. I'm somebody that strictly adheres to, to vertical stereo decisis, you know, faithfully following the precedent of higher courts. But the one thing you can rest assured about it is, if it doesn't help you in one case, it might help you in the next case. I'm consistent in how I apply the law in every case. And I don't I don't pick winners or losers. The law does. Thank you so much. Yeah. And so for those who want to follow you on Twitter, because you are very active on Twitter, there is a thing. I'll just tell those of you who aren't lawyers, you're not going to want to necessarily follow hashtag appellate Twitter. Yeah. But um it can get very lively. It can um, a lot of for hashtag appellate Twitter. The Oxford comma and fonts and <laughs> and one space or two space, all sorts of uh, interesting battles go on. Exactly. Yeah, Judge Dillard at Judge Dillard uh, on Twitter, and I'm on Instagram. I don't really do as much on there. Uh, it's S L A Dillard. They're welcome to follow me on Instagram, and then I'm on. I've got a personal Facebook page, and what I tell people is. I accept friend requests from anybody who lives in Georgia, as long as it's not a spam account. I'm getting ready to max out. I think 5,000 followers is or friends is about as much but as you, you can keep going on Twitter. So that's well, why the Twitter and is I've got open. The, and I've got the government page, too, on Facebook. So those and I'm on LinkedIn. I, I'm pretty free about just accepting anybody because my view is any any citizen of Georgia is my boss. And so I'm all about being open and transparent with the people I serve. Well, on every episode of Law Talk, yes, we enjoy a cup of tea and yes, we're chatting. Yes, it's been nice. And so this tea, and I try to pick a tea appropriate for my guests. And this is a jasmine tea okay. with a little green tea infusion. Okay. And I chose it because it gives a calming effect. And jasmine is considered excellent for divination. I love it. And, you know, there needs to be some divine guidance, as you mentioned, that what powers your life and yeah. your beliefs that that infuses to do justice uh, absolutely and so um we'll clink tea yes cups to absolutely. justice absolutely and mercy and mercy and walking humbly with your god that's all good <laughs> i'll take it thank you all right thank you for having me this podcast is not to be construed as legal advice with any legal issue, you should reach out to a professional attorney that practices law in the state and area of law for which you need information or consultation. Law Talk with BJ does not establish an attorney-client relationship, which is only formed when you have hired an attorney and signed an engagement agreement or contract. 
It's Law Talk with BJ Music Theme, written and produced by Atlanta Audible. This podcast copyright 2018, BJ Bernstein Esquire. <laughs>